All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining me for this morning's Bible study, our Bible training of we are studying journey into building better relationships. This has been a great study. And so again, good morning to you all. I see there is an AJD uh, on with us this morning. Okay. Uh, well, good morning. Thank you uh, for joining us. And uh, we hope to be able to go ahead. You want to say good morning to us? Go ahead. Good morning. Oh, well, wonderful. Good morning there, AJ. <laughs> Thank you for joining, joining us this morning. Um, yeah. We're looking forward to a great lesson. This is a great, great lesson. I think this is something that we all can benefit from this study. I want to encourage you, if you have not uh, been able to attend all of the Bible studies that we've done, go back to the uh, YouTube and all of the uh, studies are there. So you can go back and kind of see uh, what we've been uh, discussing. This is some very, very good information for all of us because all of us are in relationships, uh, uh, parent-child relationship, uh, husband and wife, significant others, friendship relationships, uh, worker, you know, co-working relationships. So, this deal and a relationship with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So this lesson is very, very essential for us if we desire to build better relationship. Without this, we will continue to experience a lot of turmoil in our marriages. Uh, we will experience some disconnections with our children our siblings, uh, you know, all those who we experience relationships with. And so I urge you, that means I beg you, I plead with you to take advantage of this study. Uh, get familiar with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 so that you will understand how we can perfect the matters. And so we are talking about controlling your anger. That's what we're talking about this morning, controlling your anger. Uh, the foundational scripture is 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5, the C clause of that. And so I want to ask if someone would read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verse five, and you can stop at the, after you read the part about anger, you can stop there. And so if someone start off reading that, and after which we'll have Deacon to give us a, a opening prayer. Can I read? Pastor, can I read? Yes, you can. Yes. I can. Hey, Nevaeh, good morning. Hi, good morning. <laughs> Go ahead, read. <laughs> Do I have a smart? Yeah, okay. Have you been angry with someone in the last year? What about the last month or last week? What about today? Anger is one of the most present enemies of healthy relationships. Therefore, building better relationships requires knowing how to control your anger. What does First Corinthians 13, 5 C tell us about love? So do I tell the answer? Uh -huh. Pastor, do, do I tell the answer? Yes, you can go ahead and answer. Love is not irritable. Okay. All right. So love is not irritable. My say love is not provoked. All right. Uh, anybody else has a different expression of that from your translation? Go ahead, Deacon. Uh, it says, and it keeps no record of being wronged. 
it keeps our record of being wrong. Okay, we're it should be something about anger. That's thirteen five C, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Thinketh no evil. Oh, there you go. Yeah, she got she got the KJV like me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not provoked. Thinks no evil. Okay. Um. Anybody else? I I have provoked. But what about the uh, resentful? Okay. Uh. In the NIV here, it says it is not easily angered. Okay, so you should have something that that means anger, you know, that it's, it expresses the thought of anger. Um, so uh, so that's what basically uh, Paul is expressing in this particular verse, uh, well, at least portion of what's in the verse. And then uh, this lesson is talking about controlling your anger. Okay, so Deacon, go ahead and pray. Uh, right quick. Thank you, Nevaeh, for reading that. Let us bow. Father God, we give you thanks, Lord, for another day. Thank you for waking us up. Thank you for ga gathering us here to get together, Father God. Father, I lift up Pastor to you right now, Lord, as he uh, embarks on teaching your word in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 um, about anger, about controlling our anger, Father God. We know that most of us or all of us, we deal with this and uh, it's a it's a hard situation at times and um, help us to understand it, Father God, help us to uh, apply these principles to our lives so we can better know and, and um, exercise how to control our anger, Father God. Fill up, Pastor, with your word, Father, as you relays it to the flock and may we receive it with open ears and open hearts and may we apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so again, um, this lesson is about learning how to control your anger. And I believe getting angry is common, but the good news is that we can control the anger and we can deal with the anger so that we want uh, damage the relationships that we have with one another. And so the question as uh, she read started off with, have you been angry with someone in the last year? It's a question for everybody. All right. The next question is, what about the last month or the last week? Have, have anybody been angry with somebody in the last month or the last week? Okay, uh, what about today? So, so anybody been angry with someone today? Yeah, they have to be someone we know, because you know it could be anybody that's driving down the street. I I get mad at them, angry every day. All right, you you're not a road rage person, are you? No, I'm just saying they just make me angry. <laughs> I control it. I control. Us in the road range at most times. All right. All right. Good, good, good. So anger is one of the most persistent enemies of healthy relationships. So circle that word enemies. And and I would love us to circle that word because we need to understand that angry, anger is not a friend of ours. If we look back and assess the times we got anger, angry and the uh, damages that it done to our relationships, we realize it's, it's just not good. All right. So Paul, therefore, building better relationship requires, circle requires, knowing how to control, circle the word control, control your anger. All right. So the key words here that we've circled so far is enemies and then requires and then control. 
Some people have misconceptions about controlling their anger. They say something like, I'm just like my dad. I have a short fuse. Or I can't help getting angry. God made me that way. Anybody thought like that, express those thoughts? Okay. Uh, we didn't inherit our anger, and God doesn't make us become angry. Anger is a learned behavior. We learn it from someone else. So whether we admit it or not, we can learn how to control our anger. Circle the word learn. We can learn how to control our anger. And if you look on the right side of, of the paper, there's a picture of a angry looking man um, and then a smiley face. So I colored that in. So if you want to circle that or color that in, you can just so that you can see the image here of being able to control your anger, all right? For example, have you ever been in a disagreement with your spouse using loud, harsh words and then the telephone rings? You pick up the phone and in a soft, nice voice, you say, hello. Anybody can relate to that? You're yelling and screaming with your, with your spouse or then when the phone rings, you can pick up in a calm voice, basically. That's what? Controlling your anger, right? It's putting a filter on it or being able to suppress it, all right? What does Proverbs 16, 13, I mean, 1632 say about you if you can control your anger? All right, let's go there to that verse. Proverbs uh Chapter 16, verse 32. I'd like to share. Go ahead. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules in spirit than he who captures a city. Okay. What does that mean to you? What is that? What is being expressed in that in that proverb? Anybody? Um, my Bible says it's better to have self-control than to conquer the city. Okay. So it's more rewarding to have control over your emotions than it is to conquer the argument or conquer the person you're angry at. Angry at. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Basically, Make you stronger than anything else, than the strongest man. And you can, do, uh, oh, I can't get it together as far as I can know. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, so, you know, basically what both of you are saying and what the lesson is uh, communicating to us is that you can control your anger, you know, and uh, having that sense of control of not, not being so quick to anger, but, you know, that short fuse, or, well, that long fuse, rather, having that long fuse and being slow to anger. And the person who demonstrates a slow to anger spirit or a a uh, quiet spirit uh, is is indeed, in a sense, uh, better and stronger than a person who can capture a city. So that strength in being able to control your emotions. You get that? And so um, if we're lacking that, my encouragement is to pray about that. Take, you know, give those areas of weaknesses and areas where you, you don't have any control over to God so that he can help you in, in this area 
if the scripture is teaching us to do these things, then the Lord is already saying that these things can be done. They're not impossible. If the scripture is speaking that you can do it, then you have to speak what the scripture is saying. And so, um, so thank you. Thank you. All right. So controlling your anger requires at least four actions. Uh, and the four actions we have here is to consider the types of anger, contemplate the consequences of your anger, concentrate on the cause of your anger, uh, and then, uh, did I name them all? Constrain your words. Constrain your words. Confess your anger. As I said, page 38. All right. So, uh, before we transition to these, do anyone have any thoughts that they want to implement in the lesson? Okay. If not, then go ahead, somebody start reading, get you guys involved. Uh, so, again, there are four actions. Uh, requires, four action. Uh, circle the word requires. And then circle four actions. Okay. Um, I do this because I want us to understand that require means this is something we have to do if we want to succeed in this. And then the second circle in the four actions is we got to complete the, the stages here. Okay. We can't halfway do it and then expect to grow fully. All right. We'll only get out of it what we put into it. So if somebody can go ahead and start reading consider the types of anger. I'll read past okay. Consider the types of anger. In the Greek New Testament, three different words are used for anger. The first word is usually translated wrath. Thumos, which is anger, let loose a rage. It is an uncontrolled outburst of anger. The Bible commands us to get rid of this anger. This type of anger is most often found in men. The second word translated anger, or gay, is less sudden in, occur in occur occurrence than thumos, but it lasts longer. Or gay is a controlled anger that seeks revenge. This type of anger is most found often in women. Men, your wife knows you have to sleep sometimes. So be careful about making her angry. <laughs> All right, stop. Stop right there. <laughs> stop. Pastor, is that, is that why you go to sleep when when a uh, first lady getting up to go to work? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so let me ask this question. Uh, do you guys think that this is true? Uh, as he describes the different types of love and he associates the wrath with men, and then the uh, or gay with uh, women. Do y'all feel like that's, you know? I, I I think at one point, yes, but I think now I have seen some women that can, their wrath can come out just like men. I, you know, they, it's just different now, I think. And, um, I, I, so I think maybe at a time, yes, what he said, I, I do believe that. But now I, I I think it's vice versa. I've seen where some men can be like the woman as far as I mean as anger. You know, it's like it the the, the it's flip-flops, I'll say it like that. And then where I've seen where the woman can get more, have more rage than a man, you know. So um now I think I think it's just changed now. You know, I think the roles have kind of changed with that as far as what he's stating, you know, that part that he's stating, I think it's kind of, it, it can go either way for men and women. That's what I feel. Okay. All right. Uh, Bree and then Deacon. So I know when I hear the word wrath, I think of the word conquer. And um, I, when I was younger, I'd get so angry that I, my goal was to hurt somebody's feelings. So that was the, my wrath. 
And um, I do agree with First Lady where she said, like, in that time, maybe that's the way it was. But now it is more like um, a quest to anger somebody else. Mm -hmm. And to let go of the anger is to let go of the rights to punish somebody. So you have to think of it like, I don't want to hurt this person the way I'm hurting so lately, I've been more angry with myself on how I handle things. I turn the anger inward because I don't know what other people are going through. So I'm like, well, how can I show up better? That's what I get angry about, like about myself. Like, how can I show up better? So I just transfer it to bettering myself and how I take things. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Deacon. Man, that was a good answer. I feel the same way how Bree said, uh, I get angry at myself. Um uh, at the situation like could have been handled handled better but I feel um I feel you can do both of them I feel you can do through most and uh or gay so if you if you're like you got real angry right and then you just you simmered down you plotted revenge like that's what I feel you can do too as well um like you can lash out say some harsh words and then um, in the back of your mind, you're like, okay, this is how I'm going to, you know, get this person back. Or you start, you start thinking about revenge. So I think you can do both of them in a sense. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, continue to uh, read. Okay. The third um, New Testament word for anger is per, per or Orgimos, per orgimos, which means to be provoked because of an offense or pro provocation. It is be being angry with an offender. It, it is the word used in the last phrase of Ephesians 4 and 26. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sin go down on your anger. Okay. In stop. other words, yes. stop. Um, Sister Christina, did you want to say something? I saw your hand up a second. No. Um, I was just gonna say I don't feel like I'm very revengeful, but I do feel that um, like whenever I get provoked, I feel like honestly I feel like I'm really good at controlling my anger, but to a certain point, like because I I feel like I'm definitely that one. Whenever I get provoked enough, then I turn into like that first one. Like then I'll I explode, you know. Like sometimes I worry like oh by biting my tongue for too long, you know, like it'll like build up in me. And then whenever, whenever I do finally snap, oh, I like, I'll snap, snap, you know, mm -hmm. but I, I, I am more like that. Like I have to be provoked and provoked and provoked. And then I have like a pretty long fuse with it, you know, but then I blow up big. But, and I do get like what Brent was saying too. Like I'll get upset with myself, like afterwards, like, damn, like, you know, I wish I wouldn't have reacted that way. I wish I wouldn't have got, you know, so mad or, you know, had those things. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And so um, the scripture that is attached to that is Ephesians 4.26. And the lesson encourages us to write the verse below. And I hope that you uh, are always going before we study going through the lesson and answering the questions and writing the scriptures in. And it says, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And so we see here that it's possible for you to be angry, but not sin, not, you know, not allow that anger to drive you to the point of destruction or sin. And it encourages you basically not to let the sun go down on that anger, basically meaning, you know, um, in one of the illustrations he used here in the uh, lesson, and we tell this to couples all the time too, is, don't go to bed mad at each other. You know, don't don't go to bed angry. Because some folk will wake up okay, but then some people will wake up still angry. But the verse teaches us that 
we could control it. And so it's like the anger sometimes is justified. You know, you know, someone offended you. Uh, you know, you were provoked. Somebody provoked you, or they uh the the verse that uh Nevea read from the scripture said irritated basically, you know, you you know, you irritated me. You basically you you're making me angry. Okay. And so when people sometimes provoke you, you have to still recognize that you are in control of your emotions and your feelings and outbursts and loud shouts, profanity, insulting words, tit for tat is not justified. It's not justified. All it does is make things worse. And we'll see this illustrated in the lesson here. So um, continue to read. In other words, don't let the sun go down on your provocation. Never go to bed angry with a person. The word translated is not irritable or is not easily provoked. In 1 Corinthians 13, 5c is a form of the, of the word translated anger in Ephesians 4, 26b. It means to be, it means to be provoked by a person. The, the reason we should never be angry with a person is we cannot love them and be angry with them at the same time. Okay, now stop there. Now, remember, we're talking about love. And we're talking about components of love. And so the lesson is telling us, or the scripture is teaching us, that love is not a, I mean, anger is not a component of love. So, and you notice that he doesn't say that, you know, the scripture doesn't say love um, is not, I mean, the best way I can express it is this. The, the scripture says love is not easily provoked. You get it? it? It doesn't really talk about the person that does something to you. It's talking about your response to the things that people do to you. You see how Paul is wording the wording the uh the verse? He says, love is not easily provoked. So so basically he's saying is that I ought to love in such a way that I don't allow myself to become so easily angered at what the the people in my life does you, you to the point where my anger becomes explosive that makes sense so so because being angry and people make us angry all the time uh it seems it's so common the lesson is teaching us how to deal with it better and how to so it won't be destructive, but in a sense, it could be constructive if we use it the right way. Okay, so this he says that uh, the reason we should not never be angry uh, with a person is we cannot love them and be angry with them at the same time, and 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 you know it's hard to show love when we're angry with people. But there are times when we need to be showing love and we should always be showing love, but it's challenging because of our feelings. So you see the you see where where the you see the trouble here? When God needs us to love people and love on people, we can't and we refuse to do, no. refuse to do so because we're angry at them, you know, we're angry at them. I'm not gonna do that. I'm not, I'm not going to, to go, I'm not going nowhere. I'm not, you know, 
moments where we need to be exercising love, we can't because of the anger that we have toward people. We allow people to get us anger. So it's a no deal now. It's you broke. No deal. I'm mad at you. It ain't happening. All right. Continue to read. When couples go to marriage counseling, they often say, I don't love him anymore or I don't love her anymore. They say this because they are angry with their spouse. However, when the anger goes away, the love will return. Anger is almost always the first thing that must be dealt with before relationship problems can improve. To control your anger, consider the types of anger and con contemplate the consequences of your anger. Controlling our anger requires the motivation to work on, to work on it. Sorry. This comes from considering the consequences of getting angry. As someone has said, when you are angry, you will make the greatest speech you will ever regret. We all have said and done things in anger that we deeply regretted later. There are at least three consequences of failing to control our anger. Number one, anger makes us act like this. Anger has been called temporary insanity. That's a good description of anger. Contemplating the consequences of anger requires remembering what truth in Proverbs 29, 11a. A fool always loses his temper. Number two, anger makes conflict worse. What happens when someone gets mad at you? You naturally get mad at them also. Does, does that make things better or worse? Of course, it makes things much worse. Therefore, what does God tell us in Proverbs 15, 1? A gentle answer returns away wrath, but a but a harsh word stirs up anger. Number three, anger causes other sins. When you become angry, the volume of your voice increases. Have you ever been angry and someone said, you don't have to yell, and then you shouted back, I'm not yelling. It's rude to, tell, it's rude to yell at people. In fact, it's a sin. Ephesians 4.31 commands us to get rid of all clamor, which refers to shouting complaints or insults during an argument. However, anger causes even worse sins. Because of anger, about 4 million women are abused and battered each year. Also, about 1 million children are brut brutally abused by their angry parents. This is because of what truth in Proverbs uh, 22. An angry man stirs up strife, and a hot-tempered man abounds in transgression. In okay. other words, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Pastor. So uh, thank you for, for reading that, First Lady. But uh, let's back back a little, and I want to see if you had any thoughts on the, the different consequences of, of your anger, if anybody had any thoughts on any of those particular points. Go ahead, Bree. Um, I have, mine has like a story with it. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I was trained in Brazilian jiu-jitsu a couple of years ago for a couple of years. And one of the things we had to learn during training is the person we are sparring or learning with. Uh, we cannot let ourselves get angry. We cannot let our, we had to control our anger. It will control us. So then it will cause us to do more damp, har harm to the person we're, we're sparring with. And uh, my professor, the person who taught me, told me that the person, even though we're sparring against each other, that person is, I'm supposed to care for that person and take care for that, take care of that person while sparring, make sure they don't get hurt, even though that is the, the what we're trying to learn to do is defend ourselves. And um, I, I just adapted that into my life because he said, if once you get angry at somebody, that anger is going to take over you and it's going to cause you to do more harm then learn. So that's just one thing that I just implicated in my life when I talk with people and discuss, um, not yell at them and discuss what, um, how I, how I'm feeling. I try not to be angry and I try to make sure I'm taking care of the person that I'm also talking to or that, so that way there's no anger and that way I don't go to sleep angry at anybody. 
All right, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, anybody else? In any of those points that were brought out, do you have any comments about it? I will say this, Pastor, that I rem I just know that after getting angry, whatever situation, um, I used to feel convicted about getting angry and about things that I have that I said. And I think, you know, if you don't feel convicted or bad after the fact, then you know, that's that ain't good. You know, I think you should, you know, if you're proud of being angry and saying what you're saying, that's bad. You know, that's not good at all. So um, I, the conviction helps. I think the conviction shows us where we're wrong and, you know, helps us to, to try to not to do those, you know, to get angry or say the things that we said again. You know, um, angry Anger is a very strong emotion, which can lead to a bigger emotion, which can lead to, you know, all kinds of things. Um, looking at anger, it reminds, um, I think we were talking about it with the husbands and the wives or, or something like that. Um, you know, you, you know how it says how men had wrath and revenge no I'm sorry I think the woman had the revenge and the man had a whatever well nowadays men has re men are doing revenge to to women and I mean they're taking it to the point I mean have if you notice in the news it's a lot of men that are killing their girlfriends and their spouses because they're angry because they're they're mad and um, and that's why I say the roles, you know, it's like sometimes I'm not saying men never did revenge, but it wasn't really brought out, you know, if they did. But a woman, you know, when, a lot of times when most women get mad, they go for the things that they know that the man love, like cars. They start keying cars or busting the windows out with bricks and bats and all kind of crazy things, you know, or try to, if they're dating someone, try to mess up their relation, all kind of things, you know, that, you know, happens. But man, I'm telling you, a, um, anger has has um, reached a new level to where now they're taking lives because they're that angry at what happened in their relationships, you know? So it's, it's a, it's a emotion that should not be ignored and should be discussed, especially among Christians. You know, we and, and I'm glad that we're discussing this at um today. So that I just wanted to share that, Pastor. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else um have anything you would like to uh add to the uh discussion this morning? Go ahead, Dick. Can I see your hand? Pastor, is it uh uh well yeah, I guess it is alarming. It it is alarming if we don't feel conviction, like first lady said. Um us being Christians, because that isn't that supposed to mean, you know, you got the Holy Spirit, you're supposed to feel convicted by it. Yes. And if you don't feel convicted by it or no remorse, isn't that like one of the passages uh, that says, you know, your your conscience has been seared yeah. and, and you don't feel any kind of remorse? Yes, yes. If you don't feel bad about it, then you can't begin to control it, you know, and, and you know, it's... uh. If you don't see you're wrong, you, you don't you don't see a need to fix anything in your life. So yes, uh, it's a blindness. It's a blindness. You know the, the enemy blinds us a lot of times from seeing our true self. And I think we look at the 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 offense and we feel we're justified. You know we feel like now the anger. I I understand it. Could be it's justified at times, but the reaction to it is not not justified. You know, we think we are, but because we'll say because they made me mad. Why did you say that? Because he made me mad. Why did you do that? I was angry. You know, so so we know that the anger is driving them rather than love. But if love drives, it covers the multitude of faults. You know. Go ahead, Sister Bree. 
when I was younger, um, even like in my early 20s, when I would argue with people or, or fight or get angry, my mouth would water and I was excited. Like I would get like so hyped up on arguing with people. And um, as I got closer to God, I was like, this is not a fruit of the spirit. This feeling does not come from God. So I don't want a foothold or a stronghold in my life. And I don't want the enemy to use my own anger against um, people around me or against myself or against my relate growing in my relationship with God. So I, I was, I got convicted and I'm now um, that I'm closer to God. I'm like, God, forgive me from when I didn't know better, like, forgive me for that. And now that I have asked for forgiveness, I have to like do better and, and try and not turn back to that. It's been a long time. It's been a long time, but like, I would like get excited and look forward to like, who am I fighting today? Who am I going to argue today? Any little thing I would get offended by any little thing I would get mad at. But now that I'm like more grown closer to God, I'm like, that is not a fruit of the spirit. That is not what I want to be. But that was like 10 years ago, guys. I'm not like that anymore. <laughs> he convicted me. <laughs> I made new. Yes. Yes. You know, I'm glad you know, the Lord, uh, spoke that through you because it reminds me that if you look at the whole makeup of the believer, I'll tell you what, I'll pause and allow uh, Minister C to, to share. Go ahead. Um, when I was younger, much younger, and I think I was in uh, my 20s, um, on, in my on my desk in my office, I had a little figurine. It was a paper holder. And it was uh, made of a um, caveman with a huge stick. You know how those, they had these things. And it uh, sitting on a rock. And what it read was, I don't get mad, I get even. And I used to get even with my spouse, my son's mother, who made me angry all the time. And so I couldn't show anger in front of my son like that, or I, I just avoided her. And in order to get over it, I spent more time out in the street. And it was how I, how I acted. And I found that I was, I got carried away with it. And I spent more time out there with that behavior than I did trying to reconcile. Yeah. And I can tell you, you get to a point where you look forward to that anger and you look forward to being out there getting revenge. Thanks, Pastor. And thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I'm glad I paused so that you could share that. Um, I, I put in the chat, turn to Galatians chapter five. So uh, if you could turn to Galatians chapter five, I want to pick up on something that uh, Sister Bree was sharing about when she was talking about the fruit of the spirit. And I want to <clears throat> show the distinction of when we are led by the spirit versus the flesh. Because when we are led by the spirit, then we are, you know, basically walking in what has been produced in us. And so if you look at verse 16, Paul encourages, and again, we're talking about anger, okay? And then just think about all the other things that we've talked about leading up to this lesson as well. Envy, jealousy, you know, uh, rudeness and all of that. He says, but I say, walk after the spirit, all right? Um, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. 
So if you walking in the spirit, he says you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. And so you might say, well, what does it mean to walk after the spirit? Well, it basically means the spirit is always convicting us and showing us and reminding us of what the word says. That's what the spirit does. It always reminds us, first it reminds us what the scripture says, okay? Then we, we supposed to yield to it. We, ha we have to yield to it, right? So he's showing us, uh, this is what the scripture says, okay? And then we have to obey what the scripture says and we have to take that course of action, right? So then uh, that's what it means to walk after the spirit, okay? So when you, so it's, it's so in essence, and I'm going to show you this in a second. So it's almost like what, um, you know, that analogy when I was a kid, I used to watch cartoons and it always was a situation when a, cartoon character was trying to choose between right and wrong. It was always like a, a angel on one shoulder, a devil on the other shoulder. So it's, it's, it was always two things or two entities are talking and trying to convince you to make a decision, okay? And so although we are spiritual people, we're also human people, we're made of flesh, right? And so there are, 17 works of the flesh. And, and, and this is a, these are some things. This is what it says. Um, listen to verse 17. For the flesh sets this desire against the spirit. So in the moments where you're trying to be loving, anger is trying to, it sets itself against love. You get it? So for these are what? In opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. So in basically when it says do the things that you please, it goes both ways because when you want to be mean, the spirit of kindness is opposing that and vice versa. That makes sense? So it says, so you want the one is, waging war against the other so that that's why at times it's a struggle for us but the scripture encourages us to walk after the spirit you see and it, and you know and you know i see uh sister taylor say that's tough it is but if we walk after the spirit we won't do the wrong thing and and that's the beauty of it is that the Holy Spirit not only show us what the word says or reminds us what the word says, but the Holy Spirit also help us to carry it out. We have to yield to it, to yield to the Holy Spirit. We have to surrender what we want to do or what we thought to do or what our flesh is telling us to do. Our flesh might be saying, man, cuss her out, you know, but the spirit is saying that's not right. You know, and, and you know, there's another scripture place in scripture where Paul says, your master is who you yield to. So you need to, you, you know, you have to determine who's your, who's your master, who's your Lord. And then you could be either an instrument of unrighteousness or you can be an instrument to righteousness. You can be something that God uses, or you can let the devil use you. That that's what it, you know. You know, people say, "Let the Lord use you," but oftentimes we let the devil use us, and that's basically what happened in our relationship. Man, the devil just came in and just messed us up. I let him have his way in my life today, and a lot of times we brag about that. But it's not nothing to brag about because what we've done is potentially kill the relationship. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, listen to me. I'm telling you, and I know you can relate to this when I say this. Uh, there are a lot of relationships that are hanging on by a thread. And there are a lot of times when people want to walk away from the relationships 
because of anger issues, dealing with people who are angry all the time. I'm telling you, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. People are tempted to walk away all the time because of dealing with people in their anger. All right? And so it says, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the deeds of the flesh, now look at all the, the deeds of the flesh here. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, decisions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, I warn you, I forewarn you, all right? Just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? He says, but, and here's the thing that Bree was talking about, and it's just not, notice 17 of those things I named that are of the flesh, but it's only nine fruit of the spirit, but they are powerful if they are in you. And so if you are a believer, that means we ought to be cultivating this. If the spirit is in us, then this is what needs to be cultivated in us. Uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So there's nothing wrong when you exercise these things. And they are more powerful than the other things. And so if we practice this, and I, I was thinking about this this morning as I was uh, getting ready for a uh, Bible study, you know, I was thinking about the word supplement. And, and, and supplement means you adding to something. It's something you're adding to, you know, like if you are taking vitamins, it is not to it, it's being a supplement to something else, you know, to what you're doing. And those on the health journey, you know what I'm talking about, right? And so, and so basically in the book of in First Peter, Peter begins to talk about that, or second Peter, I believe, he begins to say that we have to add on things to our faith, right? There are there are divine principles that we must um, uh, add that God has given us. If you go to go to Second Peter first one uh, chapter one, and we're almost done here. Uh, it's called growth. The title here is growth in in Christian virtue. So it's about growing. See, if you're not growing, this is why we're struggling with the negativities, guys, in our relationships. You notice relationships improve as we grow. As we grow as, as Christians and as believers, we grow in knowledge, we have to grow. And God has given you and myself all the things that we need to be better people. There is no excuse for us not being better. You, you understand what I'm saying? There is no excuse for us not being better. Look at what he says here in... Um, Second Peter chapter one, he says, start at verse two, grace and grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. Verse three, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. He has his divine power has given us everything pertaining to this life. Not just this life we live, but this life we live, this life we're living in, this world that we're living in. He has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these, okay, for by these, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent 
promises so that by them, by what? By the promises that we may be partakers of the divine nature, meaning we may be like him and we may walk with him, having escaped the, the corruption that is in the world by lust. Verse five, now for this very reason also applying all diligence. That means you have to work hard. We can't expect for God to help us be uh, more loving or more anything if we're not determined on doing our part in the process. You can't learn the word. You can't grow in the word if you don't pick up your Bible to read it. You can't grow spiritually if you don't never exercise prayer as a daily habit is what I'm saying. So you have to be diligent in your faith Look at that word. Now, the word I have in my translation is supply, a supplicant. Supply. I don't know what your word is. I know we're reading from different translations. But it says, for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. So it's saying I have to add to my faith. So my faith ought to be supplemented with other things. And these are divine virtues of moral excellence. So he says, supply to my faith moral excellence. I know it's not by works that we are saved. I know we come to Jesus Christ strictly by our faith. But guess what? You might not can work your way to heaven, but... When you become saved, it ought to change the way you live. And that's the reason why he saved us. Not so that we can get a free ride to, just so we can get a free ride to heaven, guys. He has given us a uh, salvation so that now we have that spirit working in us. So with that spirit working in us, uh, we can now do the things that we could not do at first. So moral excellence is the goal. Living righteously is the outcome of our Bible studies and reading the Bible and the preaching. The whole objective is so that we can live right, not so that we can just know something. Right? So look at what he says. He says... <clears throat> Supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. You see, it keeps supplying things. Supply moral excellence. Y'all can circle that. And then knowledge. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. Verse 6. And in your knowledge, self-control. If you know better, you ought to what? Do better, right? And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And you notice here, it's kind of like a ladder to me. It's like an advancement in life because when I when I when I gain one virtue, it gives birth to the other. And the reason why we can't reach the highest virtue is because we haven't got the first ones. You you get what I'm saying? I'm, what I'm trying to say is the reason why we're still struggling with these things like anger and 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 jealousy and envy and and you know and being rude and 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 unkind to people is because we haven't really gotten a hold to who we are in Christ Jesus. You get what I'm saying, verse seven, and your garland and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness. Love. Verse 8, for if these qualities, these are the qualities of Christian people, believers, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, that's a circle that word, increasing, are you growing? Because our growth should be daily. And I know, you know, we say, well, I ain't where you are. Well, that's true. I understand. But let's grow. Let's grow. We, we're getting the same medicine. We're getting the same word. We're showing up at the same time. Let's grow. And if you're not feeding yourself, you're not nurturing yourself, 
you're not growing. And if you're still struggling with what you're struggling with last year, then you got to ask yourself, why is that? Why am I still thinking the way I'm thinking? Why am I still feeling the way I'm feeling? Why am I still making the same choices that I've been making? Why is this just keeps on happening to me? And you got to you gotta ask yourself those questions. And, and it says here, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless or unfruitful. Wow. So that means that if I possess these qualities, I'm going to grow. I'm going to be fruitful. I'm going to get other fruit. I'm going to be useful. But if I don't have these qualities, I'm useless and I'm unfruitful. And the question is, why don't I have these qualities if God has made them available for me? Because we walk after the flesh and not after the spirit. When God said go left or go, go left, we went the other way. When God says stop, we go. When God says resist, we don't. So we do what we feel gives us the most gratification. And I guess it feels better for us to cuss them out, bust them in the head, write them off, hurt them, teach them a lesson. We feel like that gives us the greatest satisfaction. <clears throat> then exercise in love. Walking in forgiveness, you know. For he who lacks, listen to this. For he who lacks these qualities is blind. That's what I, I said that earlier. You know? it's, it's a blind. But for he who lacks these qualities are blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. You get that? Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and his choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Wow. As long as I'm doing it God's way, I'll never stumble in my relationships. You get it? Now, it might be some, some tough times, but as long as I stay determined and disciplined and, and, and doing it his way, come on, man, my relationship not going to fail. Not if we both do. Let me say if we both are doing it, okay? Because it takes two to tangle, right? If we both... You know, and we're and I'm talking to believers on here. I'm I'm, I'm assuming that everybody that's on here is a believer because you keep coming. <laughs> okay, so I'm assuming we're all believers. So that means that both people in the relationship are carrying out in a spiritual way. Our relationship will not fail. They can't help but get better. And that's why I always tell you, and I know this is too late to say to some of y'all, you know, but I believe y'all are good. That's why we always say, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You know, I know in... We always say, I be with love is love. I can be with whoever I want to be with. They make me happy. Yeah, okay. All relationships start off good. <laughs> Except them toxic ones. We live in a different time now. They start off kind of crazy these days. But you get my point. And so be angry. And yet do not sin. 
Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give place to the devil. Because once you open the door to things that are unrighteous, which is anger, then it leads to other sin. Anger will make you look like a fool or make you act like a fool. Anger um, will make matters worse. Okay. <clears throat> Anger will cause other sins. And so what we need to do is concentrate on the cause of our anger. You know, what is it that makes us anger? Anger is like one of the red lights that appear on the dashboard of your car. It means something is wrong. And I remember that uh, the marriage uh, comedy show we went to a few weeks ago. And one of the things that um, the comedian and his wife were sharing was when they got angry at times, they had to stop and ask the question, why does that make me angry? Why am I upset about that? And so we, but see, we have to have that self-control because many of us, if we don't have self-control, we don't have time to take time to think about why I'm mad, <laughs> right? We're going to be like the tornado that just hit Houston a few days ago and we're going to tear up some stuff. And then we're going to sit down and try to figure it out. But but you got so much to clean up now. You know, you did a damage. The damage is done now, but it's something that we should think about, try to think about beforehand. And if you lack self-control, then pray for it. Pray for the Holy Spirit to move in your life. But in order for you to acquire the fruit that the Holy Spirit is trying to give you because you got the seed in you, brothers and sisters. It's in you. You have the seed. It just needs to grow. And like any other seed, it needs water. It needs sun. And so when you fail to expose yourself to the word and to the spirit, then you don't allow your seed to cultivate in you. So it's not that the Holy Spirit is not in you, and it's not that God doesn't want you to do better. It's just, it's us. It's us who, who suppress it. That's why the scriptures say, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't frustrate it. When the Spirit is trying to get you to do something, and you're wrestling with God, and you're stubborn, and you don't want to do it because you want to satisfy your flesh. And when you do that, it's it's like two people fighting for the steering wheel, fighting for control, trying to guide the car in two different ways. Come on, guys. We don't get nowhere. We end up crashing. We end up crashing. And so I'm saying, let the spirit have his way in your life. Let God's will be done in your life. Let him change your heart. As you go through your progressive sanctification, you know, you're not there today, but God is trying to get you there. But if you're not walking with him, you're not going to get there. And, and so, so we have to concentrate on the cause of our anger, and then we have to constrain our words. When you are angry, the best thing you can do is say nothing or keep your words to a minimum. When you do that, you are immediately taking control of your emotions. Now, my question is, who is I ask y'all this question. Well, I made this statement during the sermon about the tongue. I said, either control your word, your tongue, or your tongue will control you. Control your tongue, or your tongue will control you. When you do that, you are immediately taking control of your life. When your emotions are out of control, not only does the volume of your voice increase, but also the amount of your words. 
And Proverbs 10, 19 says, when there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. But <laughs> he who restrains his lips is wise. Keep your mouth closed. Learn how to bite your tongue. Learn how to hold your peace. You don't have to say everything that is on your mind, especially when it's wrong. It doesn't matter what they said to you. You don't have to do fire with fire. The Bible says, uh, render good in the place of evil. You got to learn how to be a, a, a fire extinguisher, not a fire starter. Stop striking the matches because a small match can cause a forest fire. Just a little word uh, you say can cause a little spark. And man, the whole house is on fire. And by you, by the time you you know it, you done lost your marriage. You done lost, you have a, uh, you know, broken relationship with your family and your kids. And you have no friends. And you can't keep a job because your mouth gets you in trouble. You lose things because your mouth keep you in trouble. And, it, and, it's, and it's because we're angry. And I'm telling you, you can be angry and yet still not sin. You can control it. Don't let it control you. You control it. Okay? Confess your anger as a sin. That's the other thing. Stop feeling like we're justified. Confess it as a sin. Stop making excuses. Simply admit your anger is a sin because it leads to wrath. God tells us that wrath, uh, which is anger let loose, is cruel. That's Proverbs 27, 4a. Have, have you ever been cruel to someone you love? He says, I have. When I have vented my anger, I have been cruel to my wife and to my kids. And I know we can relate to this because we do things that we don't mean. We turn around and apologize later. But man, uh, you know, we already, you know, and now you got to build you know, that hurt, you know, go ahead, first lady. I was, I was going to say that a lot of times um, when we have dealt with, um, you know, anger at work, sometimes we, we bring that anger home to our families and we mm -hmm. take it out on the, on our spouse and our children and they had nothing to do with it. And, and, you know, we just, you know, we don't leave it there. You know, we tend to bring it home and now it's affecting the family and the, the spouse and the kids. Like, what we do? We ain't do nothing. Why you mad at us? And, you know, so that um, that's uh, this this last point. That's what made me think about, um, you know, taking taking our anger home, especially if we, if we got mad or something happened at work, we, you know, bringing it home to our family. And we have to learn how to separate that as well. You know, whatever happened at work, you leave it at work. Don't bring it home and don't let it affect your relationship between your spouse and your children. So I just want, I thought about that with this last point. Hey Amen. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sister Bree. Um, a lot of times when I am, if I do get angry, um, I will like vent or confide and like, <laughs> specifically my mom because I know she will like not allow she'll tell me like if I'm wrong my mom will always tell me if if I'm wrong you know and sometimes I don't know if venting to my mom or confiding in people like it's not like I'm telling anybody who will hear me you know it's just one specific person because I know she's not going to let me uh be leaded blindly by myself like she's gonna let me know like hey, you're wrong, you know, like, that's something you need to work on. Like, I always put myself around people who are going to not uh, co-sign with me, but let me know, like, no, you're wrong, you know? So I wonder, is, is that okay to do 
to confide in like somebody to so they can tell me if I'm wrong or not. Sorry, my son's playing. <laughs> oh, no, I don't. I don't think it's it's wrong to go to people for for advice. You know, um, I, I think the problem oftentimes in going to other people is that we most of the time we feel like we're right. And so we go and try to expose the fault of the other person. And people sometimes have to stop us and show us where we're wrong. So I think that, you know, if, and, and here's my thing to it, because this that is a, 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 a habit that a lot of people have. As soon as they get into a, a, a little confrontation with someone, they start calling up everybody and and talking about it and 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 they oftentimes you want to say something oh go ahead go ahead you so they 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 go go ahead i'm sorry go ahead I, I, i'm misreading you go ahead no i was just saying like i only tell my mom i don't go and tell like i don't call like a lot of people up i just tell like my mom because i know like she knows me you know and she knows like how I I'll be and if she tells me something I'm not going to take it personal I'm like she's telling me this because she loves me she wants me to do better you know so that's why I confide in in her I'll, I'll I pray about it and then sometimes God's like you need to I let me somebody else talk to you like let me use somebody else and I know my mom's gonna like lay it down like the law she's gonna be like girl you're acting crazy you know like that's you like it's you so that's just something I wanted to like yeah, mention because I know a lot of people they'll call up everybody, and I go that's turning into gossiping now about yeah. some. Yes, and and I understood exactly what you were saying, and that's why I, you know I started off by saying you know there's nothing wrong with that. Then I thought about those people who do do the opposite. You know, I think that we have to be able to understand what Scripture requires of us, and the right way of going about handling situations because Jesus gives us that, those steps. It's if you have a fault, what, you know, you have, you're at odds with a brother or sister, you need to be able to spiritually communicate with, with that individual. And if things can't get worked out among you, then you, you bring in, another person you don't go and gossip about that person you don't go and 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 tell your side of the story and make yourself look like you you know you you didn't do nothing wrong but the other people are wrong you know it's it's the way that it's the motive behind what we do because you know it's about resolving the relationships and and and, and we as spiritual people ought to be <laughs> ought to be able to resolve our relationships in a spirit of peace you know and if and if and if you can't work things out with people at least at least you did everything within your power to make it work and you know and you exhausted all of your opportunities and all of your options in fixing this relationship and if you can't, if it can't be fixed, then hey, it's what it is. Okay, you wash your hands and you move forward. Okay, so um, so anyway, thank you for sharing that. Uh, thank all of you um, um, for your comments in the uh, chat. All of you who are on with us, uh, I see Imel Imelda is on with us. Uh, this morning. I hope I didn't mispronounce your name. Uh, is on with us this morning. Thank you for joining us. I see that Brother Jay Morris uh, is on with us. And uh, if she is on with us as well, good morning to you, uh, Sister Sia. Uh, and to all of you who are joining in with us, Sister Erica, I see you. Um, everyone, bless you. Thank you for uh your commitment uh, to our Saturday study. I pray uh, we can talk about this subject all day. 
Uh, and I pray that, uh, go ahead, First Lady, I see your hand. I am so sorry, but I, I, will, I definitely want to say this before we get off today. When someone makes us, you know, make us angry, I, 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 I didn't got to the point where I choose, I pick my battles. I don't have to, you don't have to always react. You don't always have to say something, you know. Um, I think you should learn how you should be discerning to the spirit of when it's the appropriate time to say something and when not, you know. And I think a lot of times when we choose wrong and we say things, that's what angers the other person, you know. Um, as Christians, we, you know, of course, our reaction should be better, you know, of how people approach us. Now, I'm not saying the way they approach us is right. You know, it's not. But again, as Pastor have been saying all morning, our reaction, not saying you should get mad. You know, I'm not, I mean, it, I mean, we, it's a natural of, you know, for us to kind of get upset when somebody says something to us, you know, the way they say it. But Pick and choose. Sometimes you could save a whole argument by picking and choosing. Is this something I should just, you know, or you know what? Let them say what they're going to say. God, pray, give it to God, give it over the situation over to God and let them handle it. You know, sometimes you don't have to say anything. You know, I, I think we should just learn how to pick and choose the right battles to, to fight or however you want to say <laughs> But everything doesn't have to have a reaction. And I've learned that. And I'm and trust me, I've learned it at work. I, and it's it's so much better. Like I remember I always wanted to say something because it's like they were always saying something. It, it was getting it was irritating me. I was getting irritated. I was getting frustrated. And now some, and most of the time I don't even say anything anymore. Because it's just, I mean, what is it gonna do for me? You know, I, I'm not trying to lose my job. <laughs> I need my job. So, you know, I just give things over to God. I just pray. I pray for that person. I pray for the situation, whatever happened, whatever was said, and I leave it there and I just move on, you know. So I, I just felt like just, just, you know, be careful. Don't always react to what has been said to you, even in the manner that it came to you. You know, sometimes God, you know, it's, it's about what we do at the end, you know? So um, I just wanted to share that. Uh -huh. Thank you, sister. And let me say this before Bree uh, say something. If you sit back and contemplate on why you're angry, oftentimes you're gonna realize you have no reason to be angry. You, you get what I'm saying? Because there's something deep within us that makes us mad. And we got to confront those things. You know, not all anger is justified is what I'm saying. Now, there may be some anger that is justified, but you need to figure out if your anger is justified or not before you react on it. Because a lot of it is false feelings. You know, there are faulty feelings that the enemy gives us and, and, and the reason why we angry a lot of times is because of the stuff that's in us, pride, envy, jealousy. You know what I'm saying? It's those little iniquities inside of us that causes us to get angry. And that's why he say love is not easily angered. He's not talking about the offender. He's talking about the one that's being offended. You know, and so that's why I tell people when they get mad at me, I just say, I need you to love me a little bit better than the way you love me. Because <laughs> if, if 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 what I said to you made you angry, why are you angry at what I said to you? You get what I'm saying? Especially if I say it in love. You get what I'm saying? You know, and so so we need to question why are we angry? Why does this make me mad? Why do I get mad when somebody does this or says that? To me, you're making it about you. 
That comes from selfishness. That comes from wanting the world to be the way you want the world to be. But the, you didn't create this world. You just live in it. You get what I'm saying? We're not in control. <laughs> you know what I mean? The thing we need to control is our feelings and our perception of what other things around us. Go ahead, Sister Brick. So um, for like the last 15 years, I've been like, uh, I've kind of been around people who made me feel like I, my self-esteem got real low. Getting closer uh, with God my first year, really um, putting his words into my life and reading it every day. I started getting like angry, like, oh, why did you let these people who say they know you treat me like this? Like, why are you allowing people to hurt my feelings or um, prejudging me? Like, why, why is this happening? And I'm like, what do I do about it? And I wanted to just like completely cut them off. And God told me he's with me wherever I go, show up and love them, even when they're mean to me because he's working on in them. So when people are acting like that, we can't be influenced by their the way they feel because they could be projecting how they feel about themselves onto you. So don't be influenced. Do the influencing and allow God to show them there's a different way to do things. Because when I was angry and when I hated myself, I wanted other people to feel like that. This is back in like when I was a teenager because I was so severely bullied that I was like, what they say must be true. I started to believe in the lies that the enemy was using other people to get to me. And he still uses other people to get to me. And I'm like, there's no, I'm going to show that person love. I'm going to pray for that person, the person that hurt me because they are struggling and they're dealing with something that I, I cannot see. So that's between them and, and God. And you just have to allow God to work not only in you, but in, in them and in that relationship so he can be glorified and we're able to praise him. I always tell God when I'm dealing with difficult people, please, Lord, allow this to be a part of my testimony where I, I witnessed you turning somebody's lives around. I witnessed you changing their attitude. I witnessed you um, doing all these things. Allow me to be a witness to how you're working in somebody's life. Because we don't know if God wants us to stay. I'm not saying some people, yeah, but this person, I'm like, I'm hurt because I love them. I'm angry because I love them. Like, because I'm angry with myself more because I'm allowing what they're saying to hurt me. But because I love them and I'm hurt, it turned into self-loathing and self-pity. And God said, no, you can't, you can't be like that because that's distracting you. That's you're giving into it. So I'm just like, uh, he just said that if you're dealing with difficult people to be kind, be loving, be positive and light the way for them because light can overpower darkness. Yes, amen. Great word. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Sister uh, Christina Granados. I just want to say that, um, you know, I do think it's very important to forgive and to try to show up, you know, in love. But I also think that you can love someone and you can forgive from a distance. And I, I, I definitely want to say that because I don't, I wouldn't want anyone to put themselves in a situation where if someone is, because like, okay, let's get on, I mean, that topic, right? That, oh, we need to keep on and keep on and keep on trying to love. Okay, yeah, but you can love from afar, you know? Because at the end, we do have to like be aware of like abuse, right? And then so I think there's mental abuse, emotional abuse, there's actual physical abuse, like they talked about. So I do think it's very important, you know, just for everyone to understand that you can love from a distance where you're safe and where you're not allowing yourself to be hurt emotionally, mentally, physically. And that's still, that's still you being in the spirit and that's still you being, you know, everything that you're called and supposed to be, but you have to, you can show love to yourself as well, you know, and you can love and forgive and keep a safe distance where you can protect yourself. 
continuing to put yourself like in harm's way if someone is if someone is being you know that mean to you where they're making you have bad thoughts about yourself I just don't want I don't want anyone you know to keep putting themselves in that type of situation because that's not good for you and I don't I don't think that's what they may inside this when they're over here trying to teach us this I don't think it's to keep putting yourself back in harm's way and I think that's something you know that's very real we have to be aware of I just want to say that Amen. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, and and I agree with that. And that's why it's important that our relationships be equally yoked. You know, that's why we need to be yoked together with people uh, who are believers and they are believers of the same principles and they are practicers of the same principles. Um, our toxic relationships are not good relationships and and i don't believe that god would want us to 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 be in those experiences and so yes i agree with that thank you for um putting that out there uh like that so that um in case anyone misunderstood or had a misconception of that kind of experience because there are people who do allow themselves to continue to go through certain types of of abuses it, and I used to be like that when I was young. I forgave everybody <laughs> because I I was taught it was the right thing to do. And it is the right thing to do. But I also learned that if I can't if I can't fix the relationship, you know, and I'm trying my best to fix it. And the, and if it's not 50 50, you know. And we're we're working towards the same things, applying the same principles. Then it's obvious that that relationship is not working, and I have to remove myself from it. Uh, but it doesn't mean that I hold resentment. Which next week, that's what our lesson is about: resentment. So we encourage you to come back next week with us, lesson nine refusing resentment, but it doesn't mean I'm holding grudges or anything like that. It's just the relationship does not work and it's not healthy. And so um, thank you all for sharing. Uh, God bless you. May he keep you as my prayer of anyone who's traveling uh, this morning. We pray uh, for the Granados. I believe they are traveling. And so we want to pray for uh, safe travels for them, uh, praying for Deacon Ray and Sister Roxy as they are going to his daughter Ava's graduation uh, today. So we want to pray for that. Congratulations to Ava and the family on her success. Uh, we're praying for marriages. All the marriages that are gathered today, we're praying for you. We're praying for single mothers, praying for you as well. Uh, families that are going through some tough times, we're gonna pray for you and, and all of you who are holding up the bloodstained banner of Jesus Christ, we wanna pray for you as well. And so uh, as we go to the throne of grace, we wanna ask, um, uh, is there any other comments or questions before uh, we pray this morning. Okay. All right, I'll give you this exhortation. Don't just be a hearer of the word, be a doer. Take everything that you have heard today and don't delay on the obedience. Put it into practice now. Save your relationship. Build better relationship. You can do it, guys. You can do it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bless your wonderful name. We thank you for your truth that comes from your word. Father, we all admit today that we have sinned because of our, of our anger. We get angry, Father, and 
there are things that happens to us, happens around us. And sometimes we do things to make other people angry. We hurt people. And so, Father, we want to say we're sorry. We're sorry, Father, for causing people to get angry. And we're sorry for reacting out of anger. And Father, we ask that you cleanse us of, of this emotion and help us to control it. When things are said or done to us that rub us the wrong way, Father, I pray that you give us self-control, help us to be disciplined, help us to think about why we're angry, help us to think about what will happen if we react the consequences and how it may make us act or how we may add to the, the situation. And we realize that nothing good comes out of anger, reacting out of it. The unrighteousness of God does not take place when we react on our anger. But I pray, Father, that we can be angry and not sin, that we can express our feelings without blowing up, and that we can stop bottling our feelings inside until they get to the point of explosion, but that we will allow you to minister to us our hearts and our emotions so that when we're ready to discuss these things with our spouses, our children, and other people in our life, we have a spiritual perspective. So I pray that you help us hold our peace until we understand what it is that we're dealing with and give a loving response. Don't fight fire with fire but put the fire out with kindness and good deeds. Help us to recognize any relationship we're in that is toxic and unhealthy so that we may remove ourselves from it. Relationships with people who don't mean us well and who will probably never mean us well. Help us to be wise, to choose friends wisely, choose mates wisely. Help us to be spiritual in our decision on the company that we keep, the type of people that we associate with, because sometimes we can associate with people who seem to be kind but they to us, but sometimes they're rude to other people. Help us, Father, to have better relationships and help us to learn how to savage relationships that maybe we're having problems with, but they can be savage. Just like how you savage the relationship between us, between us and you. Although we are the one in the relationship who always messes up and the one who always saying the wrong thing and failing to do the right thing. And yet, God, you're so loving towards us and so forgiving towards us because you overlook our fault and you see our need. So help us to be able to, to overlook people's faults and 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 understand that they're not perfect people. And so that we can have patience and endurance with our relationships and that we could show love and kindness that inspires people to be better and help people to understand that, that although they fail often, that they can get back up and try again. I'm praying for relationships that are struggling, family relationships that are 
broken. I'm praying that you mend these brokenness, Father. Heal these families. Heal our families. Heal those broken pieces inside of us that we don't talk about that causes us to be angry or causes us to do things to make other people angry. Heal those broken pieces in us, God. Remove those sinful desires that we have, selfishness, sin, envy, jealousy. Remove those termites that kill our relationships. We thank you, Father, for loving us. We're praying today for Granada's family as they travel, that you will be their guide, their protection, their provider. Watch over them, Father. We're praying for Brother Ray and Sister Roxy as they attend Ava's graduation. We pray, Father, for your will to be done in that situation. We pray for your spirit to show up and, and just be the, shun, the sunshine that we're looking for after the rain, the rainbow that we look for after the rain. The reminders that you love us and that your favor is upon us. So I'm praying for that family. I'm praying for Imelda, Father God, that you'll continue to strengthen her, keep her in perfect peace as she keeps her mind on you. I pray that you renew her strength. I pray that you heal her of any infirmities, spiritual, emotional, mental, or physically. I'm praying it in Jesus' name. I'm praying for Sister Erica. I'm praying for Sister Kristen, Father. I'm praying for Sister Stephanie and Jamal and Sia. I'm praying for the Davis family, the Everett's, praying for them, praying for Sister Mary Lou, Sister Eloisa, Miss Jackie, and their family. I'm praying for Minister C, Sister Ursula, Sister Kenyatta, Kylie, Javante, and their family, the, the grandkids. I'm praying for First Lady, Franklin family, Sister Kendra in the absence. I'm praying for Sister Bobby Rochelle and her family. Father God, I, I lift them before you. I'm praying for all of our families, Father, that you lift them, that you cover them, that you keep them, keep Sister Dovey, keep Adrian, Father God. Um, keep us all, Father. Because although we are divided and we are against one another at times, you are for us all. And that's what I love about you. You show no favorites. You take no sides. You are impartial. And I thank you, Father God, for being a God that loves the entire world. And we ask these blessings in Jesus' name. May the grace of God that keeps us and brings us close to his throne. Until we all meet again, let us say together. Amen. 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 Yes. Amen. Amen. Amen.